Hello, and welcome to Top Story Daily Edition. I'm JNS Editor-in-Chief Jonathan Tobin. Thanks for joining me for another discussion on the most pressing issues in the Jewish world. Please like, subscribe, and give us good reviews when you listen to the show. Now let's get started. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's domestic and American political opponents are not all cheering the decision of the chief prosecutor of the International Criminal Court to call for indictments of both the Israeli leader and three members of the Hamas terrorist group. While Israel haters and anti-Semites everywhere are savoring the fantasy of Netanyahu and Defense Minister Yoav Gallant being put on trial at The Hague for war crimes against the Palestinians, this deeply cynical and immoral move has had some short-term unintended consequences. As even the New York Times reluctantly noted, the announcement made by ICC prosecutor Karim Khan outraged the Israeli public. The argument that Israel is no better than the barbaric terrorists of Hamas is amoral, as well as rooted in the kind of double standards that is indistinguishable from anti-Semitism. Treating the measured actions of the country that was attacked and whose citizens were subjected to unspeakable atrocities by a genocidal terrorist movement as the moral equivalent of those very terrorists is itself an act of outrageous prejudice and injustice. And it has given Netanyahu an advantage over both his domestic and international opponents. Still, It would be a mistake for supporters of Israel to discount the impact of the ICC's gesture and other efforts by the worldwide community to isolate and smear the Jewish state as a criminal enterprise. The growing tally of moves designed to make it difficult or impossible for Israel to engage in commerce or conduct regular diplomatic activity or for its scholars to participate in academic exchanges or even for entertainment chainers to appear abroad, such as the campaign to try to force Eurovision contestant Eden Golan out of the recent singing competition, isn't merely discouraging and unfair. It's all part of a process by which prejudicial stands against Israel and Jews became normalized and then grow to be a matter of consensus among supposedly enlightened classes. The next step is international sanctions that could do far more serious harm. Israelis have always tended to ignore or dismiss such concerns. Part of that attitude stems from a belief that the spirit of Zionism, a philosophy of Jewish self-determination, should impel Jews to focus on the project of rebuilding their homeland and its defense, and not what non-Jews think about it. David Ben-Gurion, Israel's first prime minister, summed up that attitude by famously disregarding the fulminations of the United Nations by using the Hebrew acronym for it, UM SHMUM. This attitude has also led to Israel paying less attention to the need to acknowledge and return fire in the information war that Israel haters have been waging for decades. But the campaign to isolate Israel is about more than the Jewish state getting a bad image. In the seven months since October 7th, the belief that Israel is an evil white oppressor state isn't merely a hateful myth believed by ignorant college students. The mainstreaming of anti-Zionist propaganda that denies rights to Jews that no one would think of denying to anyone else comes with a cost, both for Israel and the diaspora. The United Nations may be a talking shop, but the growing belief in growing global discourse that support for the Jewish state is a form of racism that can't be tolerated is clearly beginning to unravel the enormous strides the Jewish state has made in the last decade to normalize relations with the Muslim and Arab worlds, as well as to place it in the first rank of developed economies. Simply put, the talk of indictments is merely the first part of a campaign whose aim is to do to Israel what the international community did to apartheid-era South Africa. That means a move towards real sanctions that would impact Israel's economy. It would also lead to measures to make it impossible for Israeli leaders and a host of other figures in its government and other institutions to visit elsewhere 
or to conduct normal business abroad. Israel and its friends can indeed point out the myriad differences between Israel and the apartheid regime. Israel isn't a country where a minority rules over a majority, but a democracy with a large Jewish minority majority that constitutes the indigenous people of their ancient homeland. Yet in a world in which woke myths about Jews in Israel being racist white oppressors of people of color are increasingly accepted, the facts don't seem to matter. A world in which anti-Semitism is being revived by a bizarre red-green alliance of leftist ideologues and Islamists is increasingly a place where lies about Israel are not only believed, but treated as a justification for actions that can do real damage to the Jewish state. Institutions like the United Nations, its Human Rights Council, and the ICC may be objects of scorn for most Americans and Israelis. But to the rest of the world, they are widely respected, as if they still stood for the idealistic values that motivated their founders to believe that their creation would ensure that the world would never again descend into the barbarism of a world war. The fact that they now exist to prop up the same spirit of barbarism in countries and cultures that have no use for liberal democracy doesn't stop them from having enormous power to create problems for those who become their targets. While some in Israel long believed that a willingness to give up territory and embrace a Palestinian state would make Israel loved around the world, The state of affairs since October 7th is a reminder that hatred for Israel isn't about its action so much as its existence. The movement to boycott Israel with BDS measures hasn't done much damage to its economy to date. However, the shocking support for Hamas and condemnations of Jerusalem's efforts to eradicate a movement dedicated to Jewish genocide demonstrates just how much impact the efforts of the boycotters have had on opinion across the world. Still, the short-term impact of the ICC announcement not only undermined the anti-Netanyahu protest movement inside Israel, but forced the Biden administration to shift its tone of harsh and deeply unfair criticism of the Israel Defense Force's conduct of the war. Even President Joe Biden found himself forced to say that Israel was not guilty of genocide, and it gave a boost to the efforts of House Speaker Mike Johnson to pressure Democrats to join him in inviting Netanyahu to address a joint meeting of Congress, thus providing him with an opportunity to make Israel's case to the American public without the filter of often hostile news media. As with Israel's top generals and those in charge of the country's intelligence services, there is a good case to be made that Netanyahu should be forced out of office because of the historic disaster that occurred on his watch. That may well happen after the war is concluded, but the bulk of Israel's journalistic, legal, academic, business, and security establishments have been seeking to topple Netanyahu's government almost from the moment he won last the last Knesset election in November 2022. Up until October 7th, their focus was on thwarting the Likud party-led effort to reform Israel's out-of-control judiciary. After a few months of unity, after the Hamas massacres in southern Israel, the opposition resumed its push to unseat Netanyahu by blaming him for the plight of the hostages still being held captive in Gaza and the war continuing to drag on. But nothing is more likely to bolster support for Netanyahu than outside pressure from the United States or the international community, which have long been demonizing him for positions or actions supported by most Israelis. That was a lesson that former President Barack Obama never seemed to learn during his eight years in office. The pressure from Obama to force Israel to return to the 1967 borders and to divide Jerusalem to create a Palestinian state that the Palestinians have consistently refused to accept actually hasn't helped Netanyahu. 
repeatedly win re-election. His future in office is at best unclear, but as long as he can show the Israeli public that he is the only leader with the guts to stand up to the Americans and foreign pressure to adopt positions on borders, Palestinian statehood, and the survival of Hamas, it would be a mistake to underestimate his ability to use that to hang on. It is also true that the ICC arguably has no real jurisdiction over Israel and that many countries, including the United States, will not recognize its authorities. And there is every chance that the Americans will penalize Khan and the ICC for this outrage. Even Secretary of State Antony Blinken, who is as devoted a supporter of international organizations as there is, the United Nations and its agencies, as anyone who has ever been in charge of U.S. foreign policy, pledged to work with Congress on sanctioning the ICC. The same is true for other aspects of the international campaign to isolate Israel, such as the decisions of Spain, Norway, and Ireland to recognize Palestinian statehood in a vacuum. Since there is no existing state of Palestine, these sorts of gestures are meaningless, acts of virtue signaling, as well as an immoral reward to the Palestinians for employing terrorism. Meaningless gestures, however, have a way of accumulating and creating a compendium of moves that effectively brand not just Israeli policies as unpopular, but illegitimate. Israelis have come to believe that their high-tech prowess, innovations in medical technology, and a host of other accomplishments mean respect the world over and that they can't be made into a pariah state. Their newfound normalization agreements by two Gulf states, Morocco and Sudan, by the 2020 Abraham Accords, brokered by former President Donald Trump, bolstered that belief. The mechanisms of international law can be mocked, as well as correctly labeled as the product of anti-Israel propaganda. But the reaction to the Hamas atrocities of October 7th should make it clear to Jews everywhere that counting on much of the world to condemn a movement of murderers, rapists, and kidnappers bent on Israel's elimination may be a fool's errand. Having downplayed the threat of lawfare against Israel for a generation, many in the pro-Israel community still don't acknowledge the danger it poses. Even after the current war ends, the impact of the lies about Israeli genocide will still be felt. What is needed now is a robust American campaign, not just to condemn the ICC and the United Nations, but a decision to defund all institutions that are part of a campaign to aid the Hamas cause of destroying the one Jewish state on the planet. Washington could cut certain institutions and nations off from the American economy which would give the Biden administration the tools to substantially end this threat on its watch. Relying solely on goodwill, reason, logic, and the truth to defend Israel against a malevolent international community won't be enough. It's time for supporters of the Jewish state to recognize that as unthinkable as it may be for Israel to be shunned in the same manner as South Africa, it could happen if action isn't taken to punish the ICC and UN agencies who are behind this vile threat. Thanks for listening. Please remember to tune in every day for Top Story Daily Edition and every week for the full hour-long JNS TV program. Whether you're listening to us on Apple, Google, Spotify, or any of the other podcast platforms or on the JNS YouTube channel, Please like and or subscribe to Top Story. Click on the bell for notifications and give us good reviews. Please write to us at editor at jns.org and let us know where you listen or watch the show and what you think about it. And remember, keep reading and thinking for yourself.